Hello dear friends this is your personal English coach Divyam here and in this video I'm going to continue from where I had left off in the part 1 of the story called the Chinese statue written by Jeffrey Archer and this is extracted from his book called A Quiver Full of Arrows. In fact this is the first story itself. Let me give you a background or a summary or a recap of part 1. In part 1 we understood how there's an auction going on and the writer is sitting in the audience with a catalog of all the items that are to be sold and suddenly the auctioneer presents a Chinese statue which is just six inches tall it's not very huge it's just six inches tall and as soon as he presents it to the audience there is some whispering there's some murmur and it makes the audience think as to what will be its price who will buy it and all those kind of things there's a commotion but what makes the writer wonder is how did this Chinese statue end up in this auction so he tries to dig out the history and then we get to know a person called Sir Alexander Heathcote who was a very punctual man and we also saw how he got promoted to various places working in the foreign office he gets promotions and promotions and promotions and finally he becomes a minister he represents uh, countries across the world and he is called upon to China which makes him very delighted and happy because Sir Alexander is very much interested in the Ming Dynasty which ruled China once upon a time long long time back and he's more interested in the Ming artists the paintings the sculptors the statues so on and so forth and he had never imagined that he would be able to see all those paintings sculptors and touch it and feel them himself in China so this was a great moment for him and finally on his leave days or on his vacation he doesn't does not choose to rest but instead he says let me get out and explore the streets of Beijing and uh, while exploring he stumbles upon a shop which is ramshackle the word we had learned in part one it was not in a good shape but there was an old craftsman who after having a nice and a great candid conversation brings up a statue and uh, this pleases Sir Alexander to a great extent and his desire converts into words and he speaks how badly I wish this statue was mine and this is translated by his interpreter who is along with him throughout the journey and uh, he tells the old craftsman and sadly the old craftsman had to give away the statue which he had with him seven generations back from seven generations and he has to give away the statue and now sir alexander is regretful he couldn't understand he didn't know the Chinese tradition that if there's a guest in your house and if the guest demands something the owner of the house has to give give it right away and if the owner does that then the owner becomes great in the eyes of the society in the eyes of the people so following this tradition the old craftsman surrenders this little statue to Sir Alexander Sir Alexander is happy and sad both mixed emotion and uh, finally we also got to know from part one that the base was missing and there was a little uh, projection like a uh, structure hanging out from the robe of the statue which the sculptor the old craftsman immediately fixed and gave it to sir alexander and after that we got to know the second tradition the second tradition was if you have uh, been granted a favor from a Chinese person you have to return it in the same calendar year so Sir Alexander immediately gets his saving from London from the place where he resides and gives it away to this old craftsman not only that from that saving he builds a house on top of the hills where exactly the old craftsman's ancestor had been buried and where exactly the old craftsman wanted to retire why because his son 
was ready to take over the job of sculpting so having received the gift the old craftsman falls onto his knees and cries and says that hey your highness i cannot accept your gift like that in china it is not allowed for any artist to receive gifts and especially such royal gift the one that you have given i cannot accept that sir alexander says uh, do not worry i have taken permission from the empress of china and you have all the approvals to stay in this place so do not worry you can stay in this place and this makes the old craftsman very happy and after that the minister sir alexander completes his tenure in china and takes the statue along with him and the minister as it's written here completes his duty and he's been given a lot of awards and uh, then we finally saw in the video that sir alexander spent his final years with his father and wife and the little emperor now he had a drawing room in the center of which he kept the little statue and the statue was of emperor ming for everybody to see and admire and we also saw that sir alexander died when he was 70 years of age but before that there is a will that he kept in place that he left sir alexander had written a will which stated that this little emperor should pass on to the sons and especially the first son or to a daughter if there is no male kid in the house so it should pass on from sons to sons or from daughters to sons to sons to daughters however be the line of generations so in the will he clearly stated that this should not be disposed of unless this is important unless the family's honor was at stake unless the society said that the reputation of sir alexander and his family is at risk what are they going to do how are they going to survive if such condition arises then the son or the daughter can sell off this statue get lots of money and be happy and uh, restore their reputation by selling off emperor kung at the auction now let's move on with the next set of lines this was a small recap for you a seven or eight minute recap and let's finish the story in this part this is part number two be with me so the next paragraph says his firstborn major james heathcote was serving his queen in boer war at the time he came into possession of ming emperor so you know those were the times when a lot of battles and wars were fought so this is the first anglo boer war which is also known as first transvaal war of independence because there was a conflict between british colonizers and the boers from the z a r or we can say the transvaal republic in short what's important for you to remember is son of sir alexander he was in the army and in a war serving the queen all right and this son was in the possession of ming emperor emperor kung when sir alexander died i hope this is clear the major was a fighting man commissioned with duke of wellington's regiment and although he had little interest in culture even he could see the family heirloom was no ordinary treasure so he loaned the statue to the regimental mess at halifax in order that emperor could be displayed in the dining room for his brother officers to appreciate so first of all you should uh, know the meaning of a duke duke is a male holding the highest hereditary title in the british and certain other peerages so you can consider a duke as a person with highest rights and privileges everybody respects him so what is a regiment a regiment is a unit of an army commanded by lieutenant colonel and what about wellington 
Wellington is a British general and a statesman born in Ireland. It is called Wellington. So in short, this major had a high reputation in the society and what's the problem the major had? Major did not really appreciate or was inclined to the culture and the art and stuff like that. He had no interest in paintings or sculptors but he did know one thing very clearly that the family's heirloom which means something that he has from the family ancestors was no ordinary treasure. He knew that this particular statue is absolutely very valuable. He understood that even though he did not have any interest in the culture, he understood that this treasure is invaluable. So what he did is he loaned the statue which means there was a mess where people used to eat and a regimental mess. So army men used to eat there and this statue was kept there so this uh, major james heathcote talked to the mess people and said that you take away this statue and i am giving it to you for display so that my brother officers people working with me can see and be happy and time passed on and when james heathcote became colonel of dukes the emperor stood proudly on the table alongside the trophies won at waterloo and sebastopol in crimea and madrid to make it very simple this son of sir alexander he now has become a colonel of the duke so having a higher position and even at this position he had the emperor which was standing there along with his trophies so did he sell it no when can he sell it only when the family's reputation or family's respect was at stake was the family's respect at stake at this point not at all james is a colonel and he has a lot of respect and all of these are places where james had the responsibility of war so what happened after that well and there the ming statue remained until the colonel's retirement to his father's house in yorkshire when the emperor returned once again to the drawing room mental piece so where did sir alexander keep the statue in the drawing room mantelpiece and after james was born the statue was in the mess was along with his trophies and finally at the same place where sir alexander had kept when he retired and james as well retired in the same house and he kept this statue at the same place where sir alexander had kept the colonel was not a man to disobey his late father even in the death and he left clear instruction that the heirloom must always be passed on to the first born of the heat coats unless the family honor was in jeopardy nice word you can learn here jeopardy means danger of loss harm or failure again let me ask you what is the meaning of heirloom it means a valuable object that has belonged to a family for several generations so james also had the same level of values sir alexander had and he knew that this statue is so valuable people are appreciating it so now this colonel he did not disobey sir alexander and uh, he left instructions he told his family that this statue must be passed to the firstborn of the heat coats unless the family's honor was at risk colonel james heathcote mc did not die a soldier's death he simply fell asleep one night by the fire the yorkshire post on his lap so he was a colonel but did he die in a war no maybe his heart stopped working while he was sitting near a fireplace now you know in british there is a severe cold and every room has a or every drawing room has a fireplace 
and there are chairs and people uh, just keep themselves warm and one fine day Colonel James Heathcote was sitting there on a nice sofa reading newspaper called Yorkshire Post like we have Mumbai Mirror Times of India and such newspapers in India Colonel James was also reading a newspaper and he had a silent death so he simply fell asleep without any trouble a silent death and uh, that's about it Sir Alexander died his son James Heathcote died and then the Colonel's firstborn Reverend Alexander Heathcote was at the time presiding over a small flock in the parish of much had him in Hertfordshire there are a lot of words you have to learn here the meaning of a reverend is member of a clergy or you can say member of a religious group presiding presiding means be in the position of authority in a meeting or other gathering but what is the meaning of parish parish in the Christian church means a small administrative district typically having its own church and a priest or a pastor so it looks like Sir Alexander's grandson Reverend Alexander Heathcote well he was into religious duties and he was heading a group in a place called Hertfordshire after burying his father with military honors he plays a little Ming Emperor on the mantelpiece of the vicarage you must know the meaning of vicarage now vicarage is a place where a vicar lives but what is a vicar a vicar is a title in the Church of England it's a member of the clergy or a member of a religious organization deputizing for another you can see a minister or a priest or a clergyman so to make it very simple he kept this statue at a place where all such religious people lived the Ming Emperor was kept at a religious place which is called vicarage on the mantelpiece now what happened few members of the mother's union appreciated the masterpiece but one or two ladies were heard to remark on its delicate carving so looks like it did not get the kind of attention focus which Reverend Alexander Heathcote wanted and it was not until the Reverend became right Reverend what is the meaning of right Reverend now this is a title given to a bishop especially in the Anglican Church so you can say the right Reverend David Jenkins Bishop of Durham and titles like that in short Alexander Heathcote he started off handling a small group from Hertfordshire to becoming a bishop which means the person who sits at the top of all the religious people in his area in his church so the statue was then kept at the bishop's palace and then the emperor attracted a lot of admiration it deserved so this paragraph might be a little tricky for you but to make it very simple James Heathcote had a son called Alexander Heathcote who went into handling religious practices and there he kept the statue at a mantelpiece where he stayed along with other people but it did not get a lot of focus so after he became a bishop he placed this statue in his palace and then it got all the admiration it deserved many of those who visited the palace and heard the story of how bishop's grandfather had acquired the Ming statue were fascinated to learn of the disparity between magnificent statue and its base so people would look at the statue and uh, the son Reverend Alexander Heathcote the bishop I should say told them how his grandfather got the statue and how the base was missing and how he was so fascinated and all the way from China he brought the statue it really 
fascinated the people, surprised the people, made them feel good. And people, when they got to know about the difference between the actual statue, which perhaps was created by PenQ, as the old craftsman said, and the base, when they got to know the difference, they felt a little fascinated and wondering. It always made a good after dinner story. So people would discuss about you know Chinese culture and how the grandfather was inclined, things like that. God takes even his own ambassadors, but he did not do so before allowing Bishop Heathcote to complete a will, leaving the statue to his son with his grandfather's exact instruction, carefully repeated. God takes even his own ambassadors. This is a deep line. God takes even those people who care for God, who work for God. Does God make them immortal? No. Everybody has to die. So God took this bishop as well, named uh, Reverend Alexander Heathcote, but his death didn't come before the will. Even Alexander Heathcote, Reverend Alexander Heathcote, was successfully able to make a will which said that only the sons should get this emperor. If there's no son, it should go to the daughter and only if the reputation is at stake, you can sell off this statue. So the grandfather's instruction, Sir Alexander Heathcote's instruction, were carefully reiterated to the family before he died. The bishop's son, Captain James Heathcote, was serving officer in his grandfather's regiment. So the Ming statue returned to the mess table in Halifax. So who's the son of Reverend Alexander Heathcote? Captain James Heathcote. And where did he work? He worked as an officer in Sir Alexander Heathcote's regiment or a unit. So again, the Ming statue returned to the mess where people used to eat and admire in the same place, Halifax. During the emperor's absence, the regimental trophies had been augmented by those struck for Ypres, Marne and Verdun. Now, you should know the meaning of augmented. Augmenting means to make it even more beautiful. So looks like the people who strike the struck is the past participle of the word strike and those who strike for Ypres, Marne and Verdun. Probably people who fought wars in these areas, they made the regimental trophies even better before the emperor had taken its place in the mess. Now, what happened is a sad thing. The regiment was once again in war with Germany. As I said, uh, those times had a lot of wars and uh, war with Germany. The young captain Heathcote was killed. James Heathcote was killed in the war on the beaches of Dunkirk and died interstate. This is also an interesting word. Interstate means not having made a will before one dies. So unfortunately, James Heathcote could not prepare the will which said this emperor should be passed on to the sons or the daughters and if only the family's reputation is at stake, it should be sold. Also, you should watch the movie called uh, Dunkirk. I love the movie myself. Uh, it shows the war and uh, really a good movie to watch. Getting back to the paragraph, Captain James Heathcote was killed and uh, thereafter English law, the known wishes of his great grandfather and common sense prevailed and the little emperor came into possession of the captain's two-year-old son. English law, known wishes of his great grandfather, which means the family must have told that this little emperor belonged to the two-year-old son and nobody else. So the two-year-old son was now the owner of this little statue. Now let's understand this uh, paragraph because it's a little tricky. What happened here is the bishop's son, James Heathcote, had placed the statue in the mess at Halifax 
and then there were a couple of wars in which captain james heathcote was killed without a will in place and the remaining members of the family and according to the english law they decided that this little emperor would go to captain james son two-year-old son i hope this is clear alex was the name alex heathcote was alas not of the metal of his dotty ancestors and he grew up feeling no desire to serve anyone than himself now this is a very interesting line see if the father is living if the father served in the army if the father had a strict control on the son he would have guided the son very well he would have guided the son to join the army serve the country serve the queen so on and so forth but was alex's father alive no unfortunately james had died in a war in dunkirk so alex did not have those values and was not of the metal which means a person's ability to cope well with difficulties spirit and resilience as his dotty ancestor so his ancestors sir alexander heathcote and james heathcote and all his fathers and grandfathers were so strong they served in the armies and traveled places and whatnot but alex did not have a father probably that's the reason why alex did not have those values of being strong and uh, and energetic and uh, serving others selflessly and all those things so he had only one goal in his life to serve himself he did not want to serve the queen he did not want to work for the country he did not want to work for the society but himself when captain james had been so tragically killed in the war dunkirk Alexander's mother lavished everything on the boy that her meager income would allow now you must have seen families where if there's one single child it may be a daughter or a son the parents spend like hell on the daughter or the son in order to make sure that the son or the daughter can have a great life so similarly this two-year-old son Alex was the only son and uh, the mother lavished which means gave him everything he desired or wished from her small income it did not help and it was not entirely young alex's fault that he grew up to be in the words of his grandmother selfish spoiled little brat now will you blame this alex for being spoiled little brat a spoiled child he cannot completely blame alex because had his father been alive had his mother not been spending on him a lot had he be having a lot of brothers and sisters he would not be spoiled he would not, he would not be selfish he would have have values so alex heathcote from here we know that he grew up to be a selfish and a spoiled little child when alex left school only a short time before he would have been expelled he found he could never hold down a job for more than few weeks so being spoiled alex knew that he would be expelled so before he was expelled the school was left by alex himself alex left the school before he was expelled and uh, he tried to switch jobs he must have worked as a hotel manager or maybe serving something else maybe in the garage or something but he found that he could not hold one job for a long time it was or it's always seemed necessary for him to spend a little more than he and finally his mother could cope up with so we can say that he was a spend thrift he loved to spend money and he would spend more than they could cope up with all right so you can easily predict that alex and his mother would have been bankrupt very early out of money the good lady deciding she could take no more of this life departed to join all other heat codes not in yorkshire but in the heaven so deep lines here the good lady why it is said the good lady because the mother cared for the son like an angel she gave her everything he wanted but this good lady the same mother 
she could take no more she could not take the burden of life she could not take the responsibilities the spendings which Alex did the, the the way he was spoiled the way he didn't have a job all of this was piling up on her mind and heart and finally she died she went to heaven and joined all the heat coats so sir alexander james and all of them that we saw earlier she joined them in heaven which means she died she could not take the responsibilities anymore in the swinging 60s when casinos opened in britain young alex was convinced that he had found the ideal way of earning a living without actually having to do any work so do we have casinos in india yes we do a lot of places and uh, what is a casino it is a public room or building where gambling is played so what is gambling you tell me gambling are games of chance for money or you can say a bet so to give you an example there might be a round table full of numbers and there would be a ball and you throw a ball and uh, the person or the facilitator would rotate that table full of numbers and if the ball stops at the number you say for example if the rotating table has 1 to 100 and if you say the ball will stop at 50 if the ball stops at 50 then you claim for example 50,000 rupees and if it happens if the ball really stops at 50 then you do get 50,000 so it's a game of chance right it's gambling it's casino there are a lot of games in India and, and across the world and here according to the lines in swinging 60s which means when Alex the spoiled child was 60 years old now Britain had a lot of casinos and this uh, made alex think that it's just a game of chance it's just a game of bet why should i work i can get a lot of money without having working without having doing anything so he started gambling he developed a system for playing roulette with which it was impossible to lose so what is a roulette or some people say roulette it is a gambling game in which a ball is dropped on a revolving wheel with numbered compartments the players betting on the numbers at which the ball comes to rest so it's the same example that i cited a few seconds back there was this roulette in britain and alex was surprised and glad that uh, he wouldn't have to work anymore so he did lose now it's a game of chance so alex lost a lot of money in the first attempt itself so he refined the system promptly lost more which means he might have found some new tactics to win the game he put more money that he had from his savings or from anywhere and he lost more he refined the system once again which resulted in him having to borrow to cover his losses so he borrowed from his neighbors and friends and peers more and more money on this gambling game what happened he lost he lost more and more money why not if the worst came to the worst he told himself he could always dispose of the Ming Emperor so was Alex really scared to play gambling no he was not because first of all he had a little bit of money that he could risk and secondly he knew that i have this uh, invaluable gift with me so if people stop giving him money if he cannot borrow money anymore then he will sell off this emperor anyway so why to worry let's play gamble let's play roulette the worst did come to the worst as each one of the Alex's newly refined systems took him progressively in greater debt until the casinos began to press him for payment. So now if there's one person who constantly plays at the casinos, constantly plays roulette, puts in money but loses, puts in money but loses and uh, because of this he was into a greater debt which means he borrowed so much money that the debt was huge now and the casinos told him that either you pay off or clear off your debt or you will have to face the law 
when finally one Monday morning Alex received an unsolicited call from two gentlemen who seemed determined to collect some 8,000 pounds he owed to their masters and hinted a bodily harm if the matter was not dealt with within 14 days Alex caved in. As I said Alex used to borrow money from the friends and peers and uh, someone. So these two gentlemen who called Alex unsolicited which means uninvited he got a call without any prior warning it was Monday he received a call from two people and uh, they threatened him they said if you do not give me our 8,000 pounds then we are going to hit you with something or we are gonna kill you you have 14 days with you clear off the amount and you will be free then Alex heard that he caved in what is the meaning of cave in it is an idiom it means capitulate or submit under pressure succumb succumb back down make concessions to give in or give up Alex had given up at this point when these two gentlemen called after all his great 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 grandfather's instruction had been exact Ming statue was to be sold if the family honor was ever at stake so now it looked as if the family's honor was really at stake Alex took the little emperor off the mantelpiece in his Karagan gardens flat and stared down at his delicate handiwork at least having the grace to feel the little sad at loss of the family heirloom now it's now it was time for Alex to sell this off now he was spoiled but he still felt sad that he had to sell off this statue which came from his ancestors or we can say heirloom. He then drove to Bond Street and delivered the masterpiece to Sadhubai giving instructions that the emperor should be put up for auction. So in the first part as well I forgot to mention what is Sadhubai. Now this is one of the world's largest auction houses and brokers of art, collectibles, jewelry and real estate. So where are the headquarters of this company? They were founded in England and headquartered in New York and they have three separate businesses, finance, auctions and dealing. So Alex went to this auction company and said, hey, I want to sell off my emperor put this up for auction the head of the department pale thin man appeared at the front desk to discuss the masterpiece with Alex looking not unlike the Ming statue he was holding so lovingly in his hands so what is oriental it is of or from or characteristic of Asia especially East Asia there was a person from this department when Alex came in and uh, and this person who was pale thin man he held the statue very lovingly in his hands and said it will take a few days to estimate the true value of the piece he purred but I feel confident on a cursory glance that the statue is a fine example of pen Q as we ever had under the hammer so this man he confirmed Alex that I can tell you that this is a great work we never had such a nice item for an auction it looks like the work of pen Q so he was aware about pen Q to let you know to recap again pen Q was one of the four great artists that were there during the Ming dynasty and this man identified it he said such a great man and such a great uh, statue that you're having we never had such an item it will take some days for me to get the exact amount of this item that you've got there's no problem replied Alex as long as you can let me know what's it worth within 14 days so the threat that he had got was 14 days so Alex gave 14 days to the oriental department and told them it's okay you take your time take 14 days but let me know what's the exact price oh certainly I feel sure I could give you a floor price by Friday couldn't be better so the oriental guy he said I will definitely give you the exact price by Friday when did he get the call on Monday so Monday to Friday 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So within five days, the Oriental guy said, I'm going to give you the exact price of this item by Friday. Alex said, that's perfect. It could not be better than this. Tell me the price on Friday. During that week, he contacted all his creditors and without exception, they were prepared to wait and learn the appraisal of the expert. So what happened next? Well, the oriental guy, he called up all his creditors, which means the people who would actually give him money for the statue. And uh, all the creditors were prepared to wait and learn the appraisal of the expert. So the expert, this oriental guy, would talk something about the statue, talk positive or appraise it to the creditors. And they could not wait for it. And uh, after that, Alex duly returned to the Bond Street. Why? Because he was given a threat. So without fail, he returned to the Bond Street on Friday with a large smile. Why? Because he knew that he knew what his great 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 grandfather had paid for the piece and felt sure that the statue must be more than ten thousand pounds, worth more than ten thousand pounds. Now, how much debt was he in? Let's go back to the paragraph that we studied the threat it was eight thousand pounds he had to give away eight thousand pounds to the two gentlemen or the two gentlemen would kill him so alex knew that the statue must be of at least ten thousand pounds and i would give away eight thousand to the gentleman and again go back to the roulette table that's what the next line says a sum that would not only yield him enough to cover all his debts but leave him a little over to try out his new refine refine system on the roulette table. As he climbed the steps of Sadbais, Alex silently thanked his great great grandfather. So the before even the Oriental guy would tell him the price, Alex was convinced that this would be of ten thousand pounds, and I would put two thousand extra pounds on the roulette table and give away my debt that is eight thousand pounds to the two gentlemen and live a great life so he climbed and silently thanked his great grandfather and he asked the girl on the reception if he could speak to the head of the oriental department she picked up an internal phone and the expert appeared a few moments later at the front desk with the somber look on his face somber is dark or dull in color or tone the oriental guy wasn't as happy as he should have been so there was a receptionist who was a girl and she called up the head of the oriental department he came after a few minutes with a sad look alex's heart sank as he listened to his words nice little piece your emperor but unfortunately a fake probably about 200 250 years old but only a copy of the original i'm afraid copies were often made because so as he was speaking alex interrupted but before that what happened here oriental guy said that this emperor that you've got is fake is duplicate it's not made by pen q and uh, this is only 200 or maybe 250 years old it's not the genuine one i'm sorry how much is it worth how much does it cost how much does the statue cost interrupted anxious alex 700 pounds 800 at the most enough to buy a gun and some bullets thought alex sardonically as he turned and started to walk away what is the meaning of sardonically it means grimly mocking or cynical and why did he say enough to buy a gun and some bullet because he wanted to buy a gun and the bullet with the price and kill himself because that's the option he was left with after the threat so he asked the price it was 800 pounds the most and uh, then he said i wonder sir continue the expert the oriental guy yes yes sell the bloody thing said alex without bothering to look back so alex had already started walking away because he was tensed anxious and he says yes yes just sell it off sell the bloody thing it's of no use what do you want me to do with the base asked the oriental guy the base repeated alex turning round to face the orientalist yes the base it's quite magnificent 15th century undoubtedly a work of a genius i can't imagine how lot 103 
announced the auctioneer. So at this point, Alex wasn't aware that the base was different than the original statue. He had started walking away. The Orientalist thought that Alex would be aware about the two different parts, but he wasn't. So he asked, what do you want to do with the base? We talked about the statue, but what about the base? Alex said, the base? The Orientalist said, yes, it's the best thing I've seen, made in 15th century, work of a genius, and I can't imagine how much this would cost. It's really valuable. Finally, Jeffrey Archer takes us back to the auction room, where the auctioneer shouts lot number 103. What am I a bit for this magnificent example of? This is a line which the chapter had in the beginning. The expert turned out to be right in his assessment. Why? Because at the auction that Thursday morning, I obtained the little emperor for 720 guineas. Now, what is guineas? It's a unit of currency for the British. And the base that was acquired by American gentlemen of not a known percentage for 22,000 guineas. So in these three lines, we get to know that Alex, who had given away the statue, was bought by two people. The so here it says the narrator bought the emperor, which was perhaps fake, for 720 guineas and base was acquired by someone might be a rich person for 22,000 guineas i'm very sure that this is not the ending that we as readers must have expected the ending is a little shocking for us because until now we were thinking that the original statue was original meaning made by pen q in the ming dynasty but that's not the case the statue was fake the base was genuine now let's take some time to ponder over these lines sir alexander the first man we got introduced to right sir alexander felt confident that the maker was great thank you it says felt all right and everything as you know was happening through the interpreter right so there is not a mention from anyone there is no confirmation from anyone that the sculptor was pen q it is a prediction felt confident somebody did make a statue similar to what pen q made centuries ago and if you scroll down a little bit here is the history of the base he went to a corner of the room and opened a wooden packing chest that must have housed a thousand hundred bases for his own statues so the coincidence here is the statue which the old craftsman had from generations was a fake was duplicate copy but the base which he randomly picked out from the wooden packing chest was made centuries ago and that was something which was genuine that was priceless so having understood the story i'm sure you did let me give you the summary so as you already know by now the chinese statue the story is written by jeffrey archer and the story revolves around a chinese statue belonging to ming dynasty the author jeffrey archer is very famous for his literally brilliance and he has tried to tell us that britishers love exotic items if you have understood the part one and this part as well you would have observed that this story is set at two different locations at two different time periods and uh, if you would have observed this is a story inside a story so i can say it's a nested story so it begins with the auction and then the writer takes us into another story 
and another story dates back to 1871 in a village named Hali Xuan in China. In the story, we saw a couple of different characters starting from Sir Alexander to the old craftsman Young Li and the Mandarin. Now, they all are coming from a different background. The characters are different from one another, but there is one thing common. What is that? Can you tell me? It is love and respect for the art. So what is the main theme of the story? The theme of the story revolves around the appearance of an item versus reality. The love of art, respect towards genuine art, the customs and traditions that we saw revolve around China and till date if you read books about China you'll see that there are a lot of customs and traditions they respect people and finally the theme revolves around owning exotics when I say appearance versus reality is the theme what does it mean it just shows that two things can look similar but they are actually different the makers are different because in the chapter we saw that how Chinese statue which was thought to be an original piece of art and which was regarded with such a high respect and high value high esteem turned out to be fake we saw how the base of the statue which the old craftsman set so casually proved to be an original piece of art worth 22,000 Guinness now across the chapter what was that one common thing it was a love for art and we saw it prominently in the two characters in fact three characters Alexander Heathcote, Young Lee and the narrator I'm very sure that when we reach the ending you would have been shocked the ending is not what anyone would have predicted it will be a shock to you it was a shock to me but not in a bad way in a good way this author Jeffrey Archer has put a great effort in detailing everything I'm very sure that you must have gone back to China and you are curious about China now that you have read about and known about part 1 and part 2 of my video Chinese art Alexander's fastidious nature Young Lee's disciplined nature towards his trade and culture everything is put in a very fine and minute details by Jeffrey Archer and the outcome the end of the chapter is more than beautiful I'm sure you would have understood this chapter if not please mention it in your comment section please mention all your doubts any paragraph that you have doubts in state that in the comment section and I will respond to you soon shortly I thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day ahead